even before the summer weather arrived, the pandemic prompted a mass exodus from mass transit. Many of the folks turned to a tried and true mode of transportation, the trusty bicycle. And in some parts of the province, almost overnight, new road access has made cycling a whole new ball game. Is a golden age of cycling a silver lining in this COVID-19 pandemic? Let's find out. We're welcomed in Little Portugal in Toronto by Yvonne Bambrick. She's executive director of the Forest Hill Village Business Improvement Area and the author of The Urban Cycling Survival Guide. In Little Italy, Toronto, Siva Vajentra, project manager at the city building nonprofit 880 Cities. And in Midtown Toronto, Beth Savin, senior lecturer emeritus in geography and planning at the University of Toronto. And we're delighted to have you three on our program tonight to talk about something that's well, a lot more people are doing it these days, and let's find out if this is um, a temporary thing or a real thing. In cities around the world, the streets are being repurposed to accommodate the new physical distancing protocols. And I'm wondering, Beth, why don't you start us off here? What could cycling look like as we head into a post-pandemic reality? Well, if all the measures are put in place, we could have the trips that are under five kilometers in Toronto, which is under seven kilometers is roughly half the trips. We could have all of them undertaken uh, by active transportation, by people cycling or walking. And if we have easy access to e-bikes, we could have a vast number of trips undertaken by bicycle up to two thirds, maybe even more. So we could really revolutionize the way people get around the city, creating much greater health for the people cycling and for the people who aren't cycling because dramatic decreases in air pollution have been noted around the world as cars have been taken off the streets by people observing lockdown. So this is a great opportunity, but it won't just happen automatically. We need to do things uh, as cities, as citizens, and as advocacy uh, groups also to help enable this very, very powerful demand for cycling. And we shall discuss all of that over the next uh, several minutes that we have here on TVO tonight. Uh, Siva, what do you see potentially? Um, what has been really inspirational and, and terrific about the response from municipalities to during this pandemic um, is that we have seen that with, with the right resources and with the right political will, cities are able to act really quickly to create the kind of change that um, advocates and community members have wanted to see for a long time. So this bodes well if we continue um, seeing the importance of um, offering people transportation choice and transportation equity, we can continue building the kind of city that we'd like to see. Well, Yvonne, I, th I think I'm right in saying that here in the capital city of the province of Ontario, they've added 40 kilometers of bike lanes this year. That's in relatively short order. It's certainly the most in the city's history. It's been called bold by a lot of people. You think it's bold enough? Well, um, slight correction. They've approved uh, putting in place 40 kilometers. And having been here for a while, I'll say, I'll believe it when I see it. Ah. We have begun. It is underway. And I'm obviously thrilled that we've moved forward and that council has found the, the value that will, you know, this will serve all Torontonians. The thing about bike infrastructure that we forget is that it does serve everyone. So yes, it provides a safer place for people to feel confident to ride their bike for those short trips that Beth mentioned, but also it, it allows uh, the roadways to work better. It, it brings predictability to an otherwise chaotic space where you have people trying to find space for themselves at the side of the road or anyway. So, uh, I do think it's a step in the right direction. I think when you compare us to cities like Montreal, who in the same time frame have approved 200 kilometers, it puts it into context. So great step forward for Toronto, but I think we can do more. Beth, are you similarly concerned that you'll believe it when you see it? Well, that's been the history here. And uh, I, like Yvonne and Siva, I'm thrilled to see uh, a much more unanimous level of support for cycling among uh, the municipality. And I think that's terrific. But I do think we need to move quickly. And I think that we need to have a slightly different mindset. So some of the lanes um, that are being put in, they're terrific, but they don't necessarily mirror 
our TTC system. And one of the things that's becoming clear is that many would prefer to cycle rather than taking transit in uh, the follow-up to this pandemic. And so we need to mirror those systems so that people who might formerly have taken the subway or the bus or the streetcar are able to follow those routes, but on a bicycle. And so if you look at the new active TO proposed network and combine that with what we already have, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of lanes throughout the city. And what we really need is connections so that people can mirror those transit routes and rely on safe, separated uh, bike lanes that allow them to go everywhere they want to go, not just to work, but to the shops, to see their friends, you know, for evening entertainment. Hmm. Siva, do you think most people in this province are looking at cycling differently now that we're in the midst of a pandemic? I think that um, what the pandemic has allowed to happen is for the voices that we might not have heard before to come up to the forefront. So, I mean, the pandemic has allowed um, or has forced um, us to act to respond to some of the concerns that have, have existed for a long time. Um, advocates have been asking for a long time um, in a lot of different communities across the province, including in the suburbs, including in smaller towns, for more options um, that uh, they, they didn't necessarily move to a car-centric neighborhood because they preferred to drive. Um, they moved to those car-centric neighborhoods because that might have been what was affordable. They might have been uh, wanted to be closer to community, and um, and they weren't given the option to choose um, after transportation if they wanted it. And um, and so the pandemic has um, has helped kind of crystallize that this is um, an underlying need that um, is is now becoming a crisis point. So. Um, so what's uh, exciting about the what the the move towards um, slow streets and um, and creating more bike infrastructure is that it's actually answering um, something communities have latently wanted for longer than the pandemic. I would assume, Yvonne, that um, given how nice the weather is right now, and um, you know, given that more people are nervous about taking public transit these days. I would assume it's boom times for the biking business. Is that true? It certainly is. Uh, uh, bike industry have been reporting, you know, long, long wait times for maintenance uh, because they've just got so many people who are pulling bikes out of basements, that kind of thing. But also uh, the supply chains have been affected by the pandemic. And so while they're able now to restock for a while there, we were running out of bicycles, which is, I mean, that's a pretty great news story. Uh, it really indicates that people felt the the desire to buy a bike if they didn't already have one or service one that had been just sat around waiting. Um, people have the time uh, to get more active. So we've, we've seen an increase in recreational cycling, uh, which is another reason why the active TO installation along the lakeshore and Bayview has been so important and we need to expand that. Uh, we have people across the city want to be riding and they don't necessarily want to have to come downtown to do that. Uh, but yeah, bike shops are booming. Absolutely. And uh, I feel like that's going to continue. Does it disappoint you that it took a pandemic for us to kind of gain an appreciation, a bigger appreciation for cycling? You know, that's the thing. As, as, as Siva said, this has certainly highlighted uh, what was already happening. It's, uh, it's, for, sort of fast tracked, uh, what was already there. People have wanted to ride, um, and now, now there's a, a necessity because of the, the I guess the, the the perception that transit is not as safe as it once was, um, and already the transit system was under an awful lot of pressure to move many people. So as we come out of this, and as people begin to move through the city for a variety of reasons, work, entertainment, family, etc., um, we really do not have the space to accommodate all those folks who are moving off of transit. Uh, if they sh if they choose cars, we're in real trouble. We had congestion problems before, and I don't think anybody wants to go back to that. So we need uh, a connected network in all parts of the city for all demographics uh, to feel safe on bicycles year round. So where we haven't necessarily done great in the past with the existing infrastructure that we have, which has been improving slowly, we have to quickly figure out a plan for year round maintenance and for a rapid expansion of a network of bike infrastructure.
Well, I guess this all raises the issue of whether we have or need some kind of province-wide or even national active transportation strategy. Do we have it? Do we need it? Uh, just before the pandemic hit, um, Catherine McKenna's office, MP McKenna's office, uh, announced that MP Andy Fillmore was going to be tasked with a national active transportation strategy. And obviously things have uh, happened since then, but it is still, it's still in play. We're, we're still sort of talking about that behind the scenes, and it is a tremendous opportunity to have leadership from the federal level to help municipalities and provinces across the country put in place the infrastructure needed to allow people this alternative year round, as I said. It's just so what? vital, and this is the moment for it. Beth, maybe you could flesh that out a bit for us. What would that sure. actually do to have that national transportation strategy in place? Well, I think we need it at all levels. We did have something at the provincial level, which hasn't really been acted on recently. So I think we need it at all levels of government. And I think one of the things that both um, Siva and Yvonne have alluded to that could be especially uh, emphasized in higher level strategies is the need for areas that are poorly served with other uh, means of access to important destinations to have uh, preferential investment for active transportation. So we can see um, the pandemic has illuminated so many things that we knew about, but it sort of brought them together in very sharp relief. So we can see the areas now of the city where populations have been most vulnerable to uh, the COVID-19 virus. And those areas happen to have very poor public transit and uh, active transit uh, access to destinations. So the bus service is poor. They aren't served by uh, above ground light rail. And it's scary to cycle and even to walk in many of those neighborhoods. And so we need to really look at the areas that are least served where people don't have the option often to take a car or transit and really focus on those. And so higher level plans can talk about that in um, forcefully. And also we need to look at smaller towns, at villages, at rural areas. We need to look at integrating active transportation with other forms of transportation. So in many parts of the world, when people commute long distances or need to travel long distances, they don't drive right into the city. They may drive from point to point if there's no other method to get from A to B, but they leave their vehicles at the perimeter of the city or town that they go to. And from that point on, they have access to bicycles. And I think that that's something that could greatly benefit uh, Canada. What I also want to emphasize is that e-bikes are going to really change the way we travel because they allow uh, people to go up hills. You can arrive at your destination without having broken a sweat. And uh, that can be good depending on where you're going and who you're meeting. Uh, they allow people to travel much farther. And so I'm very happy to see that bike share is adding more stations and also adding some e-bikes. But uh, I think we're going to okay. need a lot more of that. Sure. I, I, I do have to ask Siva, though, about this. And, and how do I put this? You know, trying to integrate cars and bicycles and pedestrians <clears throat> and I don't know what else, people on skateboards or little scooters or Vespas. Or, I mean, this is a real challenge if you're trying to plan a transportation system. And I know, I mean, I haven't had the car out of the driveway maybe twice in the last three and a half months, but I, I, I do know, I probably speak for many people in my demographic when I say it's a little terrifying right now, not, not being able to see cyclists coming up from behind you, particularly if you're trying to make a right-hand turn and there's a bike lane there and making it all work. So I, I need to be, get a better understanding, Siva, of how cycling can be better integrated into the entire transportation system. Because right now, I, I'm sure there's, a, of course, there's terrified cyclists about getting hit, but I think there's scared drivers too, who are worried that they just can't see cyclists coming quickly enough. Um, that's a really good point. And that's why um, the most advanced versions of bike infrastructure include um, design uh, types like uh, like protected intersections, which guide people into turning in ways that 
um, separate out different types of traffic and, and protect pedestrians and cyclists and people um, in their cars. Um, but uh, I think that um, part of thinking about the integration of active transportation into everyday life also um, involves making sure that, um, like Beth was saying, um, making sure that there's access to um, bike share or low cost bikes in um, communities that could use bikes to get to a transit stop, for example. Um, and not just always thinking about um, how, how people driving might interact with, with people on bikes, but also thinking about the fact that in, in um, the suburb of Scarborough, for example, 25% of households don't have a car. Um, there are huge numbers of people in the city already who, um, who don't drive and uh, across the province as well. But if we really focus in on some of our racialized suburbs, um, there are swaths of the population where either the entire household doesn't have a car or they have one car and that's used by one member of the household while um, the other members, um, including often obviously children who don't drive, um, they also need options to be able to get around their neighborhoods in a safe way that keeps them connected. And I think what the pandemic has really demonstrated to us is how important it is to feel connected um, to our neighbors and at the same time to be able to to physically distance for our own safety. And older people are at the most risk of being socially isolated. So if we can create safe infrastructure where a child or an older person, and that's kind of the philosophy of 880 cities, where both those, those demographics can safely ride to their destinations, then we're creating a city that's great for everyone. And coupled with that, we also have to think about what those destinations are. And we have to recognize that, again, um, the most racialized parts of the city are, or, or um, the most racialized parts of the province um, are also the li least likely to have close at hand destinations. They, they might need to um, use motorized vehicles to get to the grocery store or the clinic because there just isn't that um, resource close to their own neighborhood. So part of building active transportation infrastructure has to involve equitable community planning and making sure that we are um, creating neighborhoods where everyone can walk or bike to get to where they need to go. Well, that let, let me do a quick follow-up with you, Siva, because that anticipates my next question, which is, is this a conversation that people basically in, in Midtown or Downtown Toronto or Ottawa or Hamilton, you know, I mean, obviously they can have it in densely populated parts of the province, but uh, what about Scarborough? What about the north end of Etobicoke? What about you know, more inner suburbs in Ottawa. What about Barhaven? Are people, are, you know, is cycling an option in those parts of the province and do strategies take that into account? I think that cycling, a lot of people would like cycling to be an option and I think it's hard for it to be an option for a lot of people. Um, if you look at North Etobicoke, there are huge numbers of teens riding bikes already in the parking lots of the malls there. And there are seniors riding on sidewalks to get around. Um, and the best, um, programs that have emerged in the last couple of decades and especially in the last few years have really integrated um, cycling as a form of community health. So they've, they've put community bike hubs and partnered them with community health clinics. Um, a couple of examples in the suburbs specifically are um, the Brampton Bike Hub, which is partnered with the Punjabi Community Health Services. And that is a situation where um, the doctors and healthcare workers who know the community are able to um, connect them with this community building opportunity that also gives them the chance to um, benefit from the physical health and mental health benefits of cycling. Um, a lot of, um, in, in some of the um, suburban areas where there might be multifamily homes, um, we're seeing a lot of seniors who spend most of the time at home by themselves um, because um, part of the reason they're living with their families is to offer childcare and, and when schools start up again and, um, and, the, um, and when people start maybe going to, to the office again, um, a lot of those seniors will once again be alone in their homes. And um, we've seen in other cities wh that when bike lanes are put in, for example, in um, the Montreal suburb of Saint Laurent, my auntie, who's in her 60s, rides a bike to get to see her friends. And that's been happening in Brampton. It's been happening at the Scarborough cycle, um, uh, bike hubs. And um, for a couple of decades, it's been happening in South Riverdale with um, the South Riverdale uh, Community Health Center. So these are some of the examples of ongoing programs that we can now build on when we recognize that the pandemic is um, is uh, a health issue in terms of um, uh, it's obvious. <laughs> the obviously the pandemic is a health issue, but also the the underlying or the um, the associated health effects of social isolation mm -hmm. and um, and a lack mm -hmm. of exercise 
um, that we can think about uh, addressing it with active transportation as part of our health solution. Well, this is where and I come in and say, Yvonne, on the other hand, you know, you're the head of the Forest Hill Business Improvement Area. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, most businesses are not crazy about the idea of bike lanes coming in and potentially taking away parking spots from customers that they hope to have, particularly at this time when most of them are, you know, they're, they're in an existential crisis for the future of their businesses. How do you square that circle? Well, uh, two things. Yes, it's a very trying time for Main Street business. Um, but that said, I think the there's a shift, definitely, thanks to some of the research work that's been done by folks like Beth um, around who actually shops at local businesses and how they arrive there. Uh, so I think that's starting to shift amongst business owners. Um, and, you know, <laughs> transportation is one of the key functions of our our cities and our and our towns we have to be able to get around we have to get to our shops and schools and work and we just don't have room for more cars that's the bottom line and putting infrastructure in place that allows people to cycle doesn't mean that you are then forced to use it it just means that you have another option and if more people are choosing that option that's fewer people in a car looking for parking uh, or in that long line of cars in front of you that's created the traffic you're stuck in. Uh, so, you know, bike infrastructure has been misunderstood uh, and the value of it has not been fully understood till now. And I think thanks to studies, we're, we're starting to shift that perspective. But um, I, think, I think shops are happy to have shoppers, whether they arrive by car or on foot uh, or, or by bike. And most local shopping is done by people arriving on foot and by bike. We know this um, and we just have to keep talking about it. Um, and we have parking lots. I mean, not being able to find a, a parking spot in front of a local business is a problem, but you have to park on the far side of a mall parking lot and walk all the way into the mall. And that's not a problem. I mean, we have to reframe how we're looking at these things and the expectation that there will be parking right in front of your destination is not necessarily realistic. Hmm. Beth, uh, I, tell me if I've got this right, because I think you did some studies about the businesses on Bloor Street in downtown Toronto and when they put the bike lanes in and the impact that had on local businesses. Can you share some of that info with us? I did uh, do a study working with the Centre for Active Transportation, and we've just published our results led by, uh, I'm very proud of a former student of mine, Daniel Arancibia, who really uh, led that work intellectually. And we found that like in every other study pretty well that's been done um, in North America and around the world, when bike lanes are put in, even if they remove parking from in front of main street businesses, the businesses are either not affected or they're positively affected by the installation of the bike lanes. This is universal. It happened on Bloor Street. We measured that. We could see that happening. We could see uh, that compared to other areas, uh, there were more. There was more purchasing happening on Bloor Street following the installation of those pilot bike lanes. But um, that wasn't a surprise. This is the case everywhere. And uh, cyclists spend money locally. It uh, it's now been well demonstrated that they are a very prime. Uh, customer demographic and that they it's going to serve businesses really well to attract them and to attract more of them and um, unless a business is selling very large items that need to be delivered to the purchaser and that can of course be done by delivery vans then uh, really mainstream businesses are going to benefit from bikes mm -hmm. and cyclists are great customers <laughs> We're down to just uh, the last few minutes here, and I want to get a couple of more items on the table if I can. Uh, Siva, to you on this one. Uh, I think the city of Hamilton basically just saved its bike share program because they got some private donations in there, so that helped. Uh, I think Toronto recently expanded its bike share programs uh, to North York and to Scarborough. D does any of this stuff make a real difference? I think I think it makes a huge difference. I think the mm -hmm. the the only way to make a decision to choose to um, use active trans transportation is if the resources are available. So by creating safer streets, 
um, that's that's one avenue, but it has to be coupled with um, making sure that um, communities have access to bikes, and that's part of what Bike Share offers. Um, and by making sure that communities also have access to education and um, community supports, and that's where programs like um, the really revolutionary Bike to School Project, which teaches high school students how to ride safely in their own neighborhoods as part of their gym class, um, or where all these community bike hubs are creating um, again creating community around riding bikes, and that's. These are all um, part of an integrated plan that has to happen together to make sure that um, that people, again, have the choice, that it's about making sure that everyone can choose to bike if they want to. Hmm. Now, Yvonne, 100 years ago when I was a kid, it, it, there was a bit of stigma actually riding around town on a bicycle because what it meant was, uh, you know, you weren't lucky enough to have a car. And I wonder whether there is still any social stigma associated with riding a bicycle today. I mean... People make judgments all the time. Sadly, we like to judge others. Uh, it's not the best habit. But I think that the bike riding st stigma has changed. It's definitely shifted. Um, we've got, you know, the business community in suits riding into the core. We did pre pandemic. Um, I think it depends also. It, it's there's a cultural lens there as well. Um, people, uh, you know, if you're if you're trying to make headway, your goal is to buy a car and you're trying to show your wealth in different ways. Um, you can show wealth with a fancy bike. Um, and I think we're seeing you see everybody on a bike now. You didn't used to see everyone on a bike. Now you're seeing seniors and kids and, you know, someone wearing a very cool outfit. Um, you know, people see themselves represented on bicycles and now see it as more of an option than ever before. Um, the bicycle's always been here. Um, it's a it's the single most helpful and joyful form of of independent transportation, and um, I think people are starting to really understand its value, both in this pandemic context, but also just in their daily lives. The idea of being stuck in a car or on a crowded bus just has really was never particularly appealing, even less so now. And so the bicycle is basically a freedom machine. And um, you can personalize it. You you are engaged in community when you're on a bike, um, but you can also be independent. You you make your own, you take your own route uh, on your own timeline, and you always always find parking, which is well almost always when it's busy. It's hard to find parking, um, but that's the truth. Freedom machine. That's a good one. I haven't yeah, heard that well, one before. It's true. The bike is a freedom machine. Good stuff. And a time machine. Uh, it's a time saver. Right on. Well, it's definitely that. You can definitely on most days get around faster on a bicycle than you can any other way. Uh, I want to thank you three for joining us on TVO tonight. And um, we'll keep watching to see whether or not this ushers in a new, a new era, a new golden era of cycling post-pandemic. Thanks very much, you three. Thank you, thank Steve. You. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.